This is part three of my lecture based on Kapinski's chapter 17, uh, Financial Condition Analysis. So we've talked about some financial indicators, uh, profitability, debt management, asset management. Now we're going to talk about uh, operating indicator analyses. Um, and so here we're using not just financial measures, um, but we're going to mix in some operating data as well. Uh, so we're going to look at, uh, these are some of the categories we'll look at, um, but we're gonna mix in, we're gonna take things like uh, net income or revenue, and we're gonna divide it now by uh, what we, you know, what you'd think of as operating measures like length of stay or you know, number of discharges or number of visits. Um, those are all, so we're blending together now um, the financial measures as well as the operating measures. So our first uh, example of this would be our profit per discharge. So we take here the uh, profit that we can allocate to the inpatient side of our operations, and we divide it by our total discharges to get a profit per discharge. And this tells us, okay, how effective are we at generating income uh, on, our, on our inpatient operation? Um, you might have a really big inpatient profit but if your average profit per discharge is low, then you're not doing very well. Um, so in this case, our nominal organization here is, is earned $157 uh, uh, per uh, discharge. Well, that's actually pretty good, right? If the industry averages 73. So bigger is better in this case. Uh, another example would be net price per discharge. So here you can estimate the average price, right? So we're getting kind of an average price by saying, what is our net inpatient revenue? And we're using net here, not gross, right? Because gross would be the amount that we, you know, have on our charge master, which as we've discussed in previous lectures, is really just basically funny money, right? Um, we know we're never gonna get that much. So, so net inpatient revenue is our inpatient revenue adjusted for uh, contractual allowances and charity care divided by our total discharges. So in this case, our nominal organization has made an average of $4,800 per uh, discharge. The industry average is 5,056. And so here that seems a little low, right? We want to higher is better, obviously, if we can. But, you know, you have to, so here's a point I haven't really talked a lot about. You have to find the right industry average. The industry average, so if this is a, if this is a um, facility that sees a lot of kind of lower intensity cases, um, then having a lower uh, 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 price per discharge would make sense. If this is, you know, but if this was a teaching hospital or, you know, a, a tertiary or quaternary care organization, um, then you would expect them to have a higher price per discharge. Um, and so, uh, so you have to be careful when you're choosing your averages, right? That, that's kind of my point. Also, so there's variation across geography. Some area, you know, if you look at um, uh, uh, calculations for uh, Medicare reimbursement, there is a uh, geographic uh, price uh, uh, adjuster. Um, the that that uh, is allowed or or is used based on the location of your organization, um, and so it represent or it it uh, adjusts the amount that you're allowed to bill based on how expensive your area you know your geographic area is. So if you uh, operate your facility in New York City, you're going to get a higher. Uh, adjustment than if you operate your facility in rural New Hampshire. So picking the right uh, industry average, but also picking the right, you know, the right mix of kind of, of comp you know, right comparison criteria so that you're making as close to an apples to apples comparison as you can uh, is really important. Occupancy rate is an important measure because it, it asks, um, you have this many inpatient days, so you take the 
you know, number of, of discharges times the number of um, uh, sorry, mouth ran ahead of brain. You take the uh, total number of inpatient days, you count up every day that a bed is occupied, uh, and you divide it by the number of licensed beds that you have times 365, and that gives you your occupancy rate. So ideally, you know, if you've got beds, you want to occupy them uh, and use them. Particularly, this is, this is not a measure of staffed beds. This is a me measure of licensed beds. So you're going to have some cushion built in there. Um, if the industry average is 45.4% and your occupancy rate is 57.9, uh, probably you're probably doing a little better. Uh, but it really, you know, an important question is also, you know, uh, how many beds are you staffing? Um, uh, because staff beds that aren't occupied are uh, losing money. Uh, length of stay, here's where you get, um, you know, you, you have to count how long are your patients on average staying when they're, when they're admitted to your facility. So here you have total number of inpatient days divided by total discharges. You know, so our notional organization has 5.2. Um, our, uh, our industry average is 4.7. So this is kind of a measure of uh, how long do you keep your patients in? You want um, the right number, of course, uh, but you know, typically we are reimbursed now you know, on a DRG basis. So the reimbursement is connected uh, for most medical facilities. So psych is different. Um, but for medical facilities, uh, we are reimbursed based on the diagnosis, not the number of days that the patient actually stays in the facility. So, you know, every day that the patient stays in the facility represents additional cost to the, to the organization. So you want to keep the patient in as long as you need to in order to make sure that they uh, have a successful recovery and they don't have to be readmitted. Uh, but at the same time, you want to minimize or shorten the stay as much as possible because that reduces the cost uh, of providing care by the organization. It also reduces the chance that, in, in some ways, it also reduces the chance that the patient um, will pick up some sort of uh, uh, hospital-acquired infection. Um, so, you know, there are other good reasons besides cost to getting a patient out as soon as possible. You know, so if the industry average is 4.7 days and, and uh, our facility has 5.2 days, we have to ask ourselves, well, why would that be? Is it possible that our case mix is higher and as a result would, would uh, indicate that our patients should stay for a longer period of time? So what is the case mix? So all patient case mix index is, is a measure of, of how serious our, uh, how ill our patients are. Um, so it is an industry average, or sorry, it's an average um, of our, uh, the, the DRG weights associated with each of our discharges divided by the number of discharges. So each so diagnostic related group right, is the you know a code that's associated with a diagnosis, the primary diagnosis for why a patient is admitted to the hospital. Um, so there's a, a, a weight that's associated with each of those. And we add all those up for all of the patients that are, are, are in our hospital and are discharged from our hospital. We add all those up and then we divide it by the number of discharges and we get an average, you know, basically a, an average DRG weight, which is our case mix index. So in this case, our nominal organization has a CMI of 1.12. The industry average is 1.15. So that would actually indicate that we ought to have a shorter length of stay, not a uh, longer length of stay. So maybe there's some other reason why our organization has a longer length of stay than industry. But these are the, what you can start to see is a lot of these ratios, you can compare yourself to yourself over time and say, yeah, good or bad, improving or not improving. You can compare yourself to some industry average, 
but it's also really important to, you know, sometimes it's important to combine these ratios in order to kind of get a, a, a complete picture of what you're talking about and what you're looking at. So it just gives you another data point. And so in this case, these two data points combined, you know, length of stay and uh, CMI uh, indicate that, you know, maybe our organization is not being as efficient as it should be in terms of getting, you know, turning patients over and, and you know, discharging them as quickly as, as, as they should be. Our next measure is, is looking at inpatient FTEs per occupied bed. So an FTE is a full-time equivalent. Basically, it's a, you know, it's a, a person. So 40 hours a week could be potentially worked by, say, two people working 20 hours. So if you have two people working 20 hours, that's one FTE. So this is looking at um, our total inpatient FTEs divided by our daily census. So how many patients uh, do we have on average uh, in, our, in our facility um, is our denominator and how many people do we have working on our, uh, in our inpatient operations uh, is our numerator. And so in this case, we have 4.8 uh, uh, FTEs or full-time equivalents uh, per, per patient. The industry average is 5.6. Uh, and here you could say, well, you know, the uh, lower is better, right? Because people are very expensive and they represent, um, uh, and they represent, you know, people represent uh, somewhere in the vicinity of 50 to 60% of a typical hospital's uh, expenses. As so you could say, well, it's, you know, isn't it better to have lower? That must be good. Um, and so I would say, well, maybe. Uh, but I, I would say really this is kind of one of those Goldilocks ratios, right, where you, you want to have it just right. Uh, and, you, of course, you want it just right for your organization. Um, so you could staff to a very high level. Uh, and that would, you know, the, the key here is, you know, staffing to a higher level would you know, help you provide a higher quality patient experience, uh, which we care about. It would probably help you reduce Pay, uh, you know, medical errors, which we care about. It would probably improve uh, health outcomes, which we care about. Um, but staffing to a, a level, a too, 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 too high of a level will also uh, uh, cause you significant expense and can, you know, as a result, you know, ultimately, if you staff too high, your organization is going to go out of business. And so nobody gets care at all. On the flip side, if you don't staff enough, uh, you're going to have uh, patients getting hurt, um, you know, or not getting uh, the care that they are supposed to get. And so you wind up going out of business for that reason as well. Um, so you really just want to kind of hit it just right. Um, the industry average might be just right or it might not be. Uh, if you can find a way to staff to a lower level and still provide a high quality patient experience, high quality uh, uh, medical outcome, uh, you know, in particular with low readmission rates, um, then more power to you. That is kind of the ideal. Um, so, uh, so that's, so this is again, you know, it's more complicated uh, than, than it just seems. Salary per FT. So here you have, you know, how many uh, total amount do you spend on salaries? divided by your total number of FTEs in your organization. So this organization spends $83 million on, on salaries. They've got 2,600 FTEs. So they're spending an average of 30,973. Uh, the, the industry average is 32,987. So it seems like they're doing, they're, they have a slightly lower uh, salary per FTE ratio. So how do we interpret this? Well, again, we want to look for an apples to apples comparison. So I want to raise this, you know, as a, I think is another good example. So, uh, you know, UNH where I teach is located on Seacoast, New Hampshire. Um, we're in sort of a, uh, not quite a, not really a rural area, um, you know, but towns, right? We're, we, you know, UNH is a small town, uh, or sorry, Durham is a small town where UNH is located. You know, some of the surrounding towns are, you know, smallish, uh, uh, we've got a few hospitals. We're about an hour and 10 minutes, hour and 20 minutes uh, into the Longwood area where you have, 
you know, the Boston hospitals like Mass General and Brigham and Women's that are you know, world-class uh, teaching hospitals. And, uh, and, and those organizations are able to pay uh, significantly more uh, for the same uh, level of employee. So an RN can, you know, get a job at Mass General and make 10 to 20% more than she can make or he can make uh, working here on the seacoast, you know, seacoast New Hampshire. Now, of course, you've got to commute into Boston, and that is like a fate worse than death, in my opinion. Uh, uh, hence, I live on seacoast, not in Boston. Um, you know, and the quality of life up here is much better uh, than the quality of life in Boston. Plus, you can get there if, when you need to and when you want to. Um, but a lot of people, you know, the, the, the facilities up here, when I talk to the leadership of the hospitals, you know, in the area around Durham, uh, in the seacoast, uh, you know, face this challenge of, of you know, losing good manpower uh, down to the Boston area uh, for that salary differential. So, you know, one angle here could be, well, this number, the 30,000 number, um, you know, is driven by a geographical consideration. And, you know, if you drive into the big city, you can make 32. But if you live out here in, in the boonies, you can make 30, you know. Um, so you have to be careful, again, choosing your comparison group. You don't want to just choose some industry average, you know, national average um, that's not adjusted, particularly when it comes to salaries, uh, for geographical considerations. You know, and it wouldn't be fair to compare New York City to, you know, Iowa or, or, or something like that as well. Um, so you want to find the appropriate, you know, salary survey to compare to. Uh, but, uh, you know, all that given this, you know, if you have the right comparison survey, ideally you want to find a way to staff uh, your organization using you know, being conserving on salaries, right? So from a hard, you know, hard nosed uh, uh, CFO perspective, I want this number to be low. Uh, as long as I can provide as long as I can get the staff high quality staff, and I can provide high quality care. So, uh, you know, there's a uh, this slide kind of talks to a lot of the things that we've been talking about. I've been talking about, you know, finding the right, really this comes down to finding the right comparisons. Um, you know, you've got to find, you, you really want to find an apples to apples comparison. Um, it's not necessarily so that the industry average is, is what you want to target as well, right? I mean, obviously, if you're not doing as well as the industry average, you want to get there. But Leading, leading organizations are not satisfied with getting to average performance. You want to find ways to improve performance. Now, that said, of course, there are some Goldilocks ratios, you know, uh, like, uh, uh, you know, length of stay and things like that. They, they should be, you know, appropriate, not, you know, you don't want to, you don't want to endanger your patients. But even something like length of stay, I remember having a conversation with a senior leader from uh, Kaiser Permanente, and he was talking about, you know, pushing towards um, uh, same-day hip replacements, which sounded completely crazy to me, but, uh, you know, I know they're moving in that direction. Um, you know, same-day knee replacements, I believe, are a thing now in some places. And so, you know, you recover. I mean, there's good, good evidence that people recover better with the proper supports uh, in their own homes. And so getting patients out of hospitals is a good thing. Uh, so, you know, finding that right length of stay, you know, first, you, you know, first and foremost is all about patient safety uh, and quality, but then it's, then it's also about controlling costs and it's, and it's about, um, you know, doing the right thing. And if, and eventually the right thing is, you know, uh, is probably reducing length of stay. I mean, 20, 30 years ago, our lengths, lengths of stay were far, far longer than they, um, you know, apparently needed to be, but our technology and our abilities have changed too. So there's a lot of things that can affect um, ratios. Uh, finding the right comparison to me is is always the most appropriate one. Um, you know, and inflation. Uh, there's a lot of things that can affect financial statement data. You know, inflation is one. Um, you know, another thing is like if you're doing uh, um, things like total total asset turnover or fixed asset turnover. Organizations that have older older uh, property plant and equipment. Um, will will look 
far more efficient than organizations that have newer property plant equipment, just because they carry their, their um, PPE on the books at historical prices, even though market prices might be significantly higher uh, than, than what the historical prices were. So those are, that's an example of distortion. You know, and I think I've already discussed this a bit, but I do want to drive that point home one more, one more time that, you know, what is a good ratio is, is not that simple. You have to find the right ratio to compare to. And then you have to think about, you know, not only the right ratio, but you have to look at maybe the right combination of ratios uh, to try to find the right answer. Uh, and, you know, even when you have all that, it's difficult uh, to, to come up with um, all the, you know, to, to use just ratios uh, to come up with that answer. So another, another key thing that, that we do with ratios is develop benchmarks. So we want to compare, you know, uh, compare ourselves to uh, kind of industry averages as well as to our competitors. So we have um, our entity here, I believe it was Riverside. Um, and so they, you know, here we're comparing their total margin. So our, our nominal ent uh, entity was Riverside. And so here's their profit or total margin or profit margin. So here's Riverside at 7.3 in 2015. The industry top quartile, meaning that the top 25% of, 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 of hospitals earned 8.4% or more uh, in total margin. St. Anthony's, which is a competitor and, you know, a nominal competitor for our, our nominal Riverside. Um, it was at eight, we're at 7.3. The median, meaning, you know, half of the organizations are above, half of them are below, was at five. So we're above the industry median, but we're below the uh, top quartile. So we're not in the top quartile. Then we have this nominal organization uh, pennant, which is 4.8. And then the lower industry quartile. So we have a Top 25% up here, bottom 25% down here. Industry median, our make-believe organization is here be somewhere between the median and the top 25%. Uh, and then it looks like our, our, you know, our nominal organization has moved from being in the bottom half to being in the top half. Uh, that's, you know, but that provides us a benchmark. So it's a very, it's, it's appropriate to look at industry averages, but you know, like I was saying a, a minute ago, in terms of salary, uh, I don't want to take a community hospital that's located on the seacoast of New Hampshire and compare it to an to a similar sized um, uh, entity that is operating uh, maybe in suburban, Bo you know, the suburbs around Boston. Uh, that's you know, that's not the same market. Uh, for a lot of reasons, um, you know, uh, salaries is, you know, going to be much higher in the suburban market than it is up here. Um, you know, their, their pressures and their competitive pressures from the Boston hospitals will be much higher than it is up here. Um, they have a higher, they have other higher expenses than we do up here. So finding the, that right mix is, is, you know, important. Um, but we want to, what we do want to come up with is some sort of measure. So for example, if you picked a hospital up here, uh, you know, you might want to look at, well, what are the similar hospitals that are in this geographic area and how are they doing? Kind of like what we do with Riverside here, this make-believe Riverside is we're looking at, I would, you know, presumably St. Anthony's, uh, Pennant and Woodbridge are all kind of the same size, same, same kind of patient mix, you know, um, as Riverside. And so therefore are appropriate comparisons. So we often use uh, ratios as, you know, to, and present them in a dashboard. So, so this, and this is a good idea. Uh, I worked with uh, a, a number of, you know, senior executives uh, will come in and check certain um, ratios every day, you know, looking at, um, and, and statistics every day, looking at, uh, you know, occupancy rate and, things like that to tell them how their organization is doing. You want to keep, um, uh, you want to keep, you want to pick 
the right uh, performance indicators. That's why they're called key performance indicators. In other words, you're saying, these are the really important ones. I recognize that there are other ones that exist, but I'm not going to focus on all of them because some of them are just noise, right? What I want to do is pick out the ones that I think are, are the most important at any given time. Uh, this, is, uh, this is an idea that you know, I first became familiar with through this idea called the balanced scorecard, which was really popular in the 90s. Um, I think as a buzzword, it's a, little, it's a little out of fad now, but you know, certainly having a dashboard of KPIs is certainly you know, not going out of style uh, and is very much, you know, very much still appropriate as a management tool. And so you should pick the, you know, the, the one thing that the balanced scorecard said was, hey, pick, you know, eight to 12 uh, key performance indicators that tell you how your business is doing in particular areas. So it's not going to be eight profitability uh, measures. It's going to be two or three profitability measures, two or three uh, operating measures, two or three of, you know, balanced scorecard had like four quadrants was kind of their thing. And they say, okay, you got, you know, financial over here, you've got, you know, quality over here, you've got um, operating efficiency over here. And you've got, I think their other one was like learning and growth, some measure of learning and growth. And those are the four areas, you know, and you'd come up with a couple of KPIs for each of them. And that's what everybody would, you know, all the senior leadership would be focused on fixing uh, or, or improving on. What you don't want is to uh, dilute this idea of key performance indicators too much. Um, so when I was in the army, uh, back in the early two thousands, we had an, uh, you know, of course, uh, we adopted like many organizations, we adopted this idea of a balanced scorecard in army medicine and, you know, not to be critical of, uh, my, uh, prior employer. Well, I guess I am being critical cause it made me a little crazy. Uh, uh, I had a balanced scorecard. Uh, I was responsible for, for, you know, trying to track, the balanced scorecard for the hospitals that I worked at. And at one point I counted up all of the um, KPIs, so-called KPIs that were embedded in the army medicine uh, balanced scorecard. And it was something like 220. Now, any concept of a key performance indicator is thrown out the window when you're talking about having 220 uh, uh, key uh, measures, right? So eight to 12 does not translate into 220. I mean, you can make an argument for 15 or something, but not 220. You kind of, you know, not, and the problem there was nobody paid attention to this thing because uh, it was just a, a, a huge pile of, of stuff and it was just too, too hard to follow. So if you build a dashboard, the goal is to build a dashboard with, you know, a manageable number of, of, of measures that, uh, you can uh, keep track of and influence. And then when one of those starts to go, to go upside down, to, to look like they're, it's not doing as well as it should, you act and you drill down further and you develop other measures to, to clarify what's going on. Um, I'll let you think about this question. So what are some uh, areas of financial and operating performance that ought to be routinely monitored? Monitored. You know, um, you know, you've got to keep your organization healthy. You've got to keep it, you know, keep, keep, its, uh, keep it having enough cash. You want to make sure it's, it's that your management is doing a good job uh, with the assets that, it has, that the management team has been entrusted with. Those are the things you've got to think about. So which ones of the ones we've talked about would you put into your, you know, say 10 that you would keep track of uh, because you'd never have 220. All right, so this, uh, this is the third, end of the third lecture uh, uh, based on Gapinski's Chapter 17. Hope you enjoyed it, um, and uh, we'll follow up with another lecture.